everyone. Uh, this is another episode of The Three Questions. And I've got three questions. I mean, they're always the same three questions. But today I am posing them to a very, very funny woman, uh, Cecily Strong. How are you? Hello. I'm all right. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's, I'm, we have been trying to arrange this for a while. You've had some, you know, some remodeling or something, weren't you? Or- well, I was supposed to have construction um, starting three weeks ago, but I got a text from my building manager that he got exposed to COVID. So he was waiting on a test. And then I was like, well, take your time. Don't put, it's fine with me as long as you yeah, need. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he was positive, but he's feeling okay. And he's did his two weeks, but then he was still testing positive. And I was like, we'll just, we'll wait till the negative right, test. No right, big right, deal. Right. I can, you can muddle through. Right. Are you in New York City uh, full time now or do you? I'm in New York State full time. I'm uh, splitting my time between my home in Hudson Valley and then my apartment in the city. Oh, nice. Nice. That's good to have uh, a little bit of both worlds. Yeah, I could never, when I lived there, I could only just do the city. I always felt like if I leave the city, I'll never come back. Oh, and that, I mean, that I'm only going back for work. I, it's, it's much better up here. I would be up here all the time if I could. Yeah. Is that a Midwesternism? I mean, because you're a, a Midwestern person, kind of like being away from the hubbub of the city. You know, I don't think so, because I was still, I lived in Chicago for so long. Yeah. So I was much more in the city then. And I loved being in the city. It's just, I'm still a little scared and I'm sure I'll be back. It's like, you don't buy, you don't get an apartment in New York thinking that you're, you are have to be in there all day. Yeah. And only in there. And it's like, which which thing do you want to sit on? Because you can't move. It feels like I'm bedridden, like I'm terminally ill in that apartment <laughs> because you constantly are sitting. There's no standing. Oh, oh, oh wow. Really? There's no room yeah. to really stand. Yeah, it's a small studio apartment. My bed's in my kitchen, I'm, just to give you an idea. Is it really? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I made a one bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> The real, I'm sure. Well, see now, the building manager should be happy about that because you you've made it more than it was. You've turned a studio into a one bedroom. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, you're you were born in Springfield, Illinois, which I was excited yes. to hear that because I had <laughs> a ton of family from Springfield. My dad grew up in Springfield. Oh, really? Was a, yeah, I was a Springfield native. You know, I I was a year and a half when we moved, so yeah. I don't remember Springfield too much, but. My, I'm I, my dad knows everyone everywhere he goes because he's loud. So yeah. I'm sure <laughs> your people know of my dad. <laughs> what, what, what what was he doing in Springfield? Was that the original family home or they lived in Boston for a while first, and then they they were my family is an East Coasty family, and then by the time they had us, we were just these squat. They went from like tall, lithe East Coast people to now we're this like squat. Midwestern family, <laughs> squat accents and squat bodies. It happens, yeah. Covered in covered in fleece and wool. <laughs> yes, shivering, setting ourselves on fire to stay warm. Yeah. Um, my dad worked at the AP then, and then he got a job at a different PR firm in Chicago when we moved. Oh, cool. Um, and how many kids are there when you say we? Uh, there's me and my brother. And then I have two, I have a stepbrother and a stepsister. And I have a, my sister-in-law, my stepbrother's wife, Sarah, and their son, Jack, my nephew. And then my stepsister, Sammy, her husband, Josh. Oh, so nice, big, spread out family. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And everyone gets along pretty well? Yeah, I think so. Surprise. I think it's, it hasn't always been that way, but it, it definitely is now, I think. I, at least for me. Who knows? I could be missing something. Maybe uh, if you when this when this podcast comes out, you can check the comments and see if they will let you know <laughs> how they truly feel about you in the comments of this. You know, I don't think anyone in my family is um, an internet comment person. Do they listen to you doing things like this? Because that's always for sure. I think my mom has a Google alert on yeah. me. I've asked yeah, her yeah. so many times not to, but she definitely still does, and she'll read. She's the one who'll read all the comments. When I told my mom about, I wrote a book, I just finished like the first go at the manuscript 
And when I told my mom, it was like a big deal. And then she's like, well, don't make me fat or stupid. And I was like, that's the whole point of the book, mom. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do now if I can't yeah. make you fat and stupid? Yeah. You too can make it in show business with a <laughs> fat, stupid mom. <laughs> that's all I wanted to write about in COVID. Yeah, yeah. I just want to diss my mom in a book. <laughs> Oh, the ability to make it about yourself. Yeah, that's a wild. That's a wonderful thing, yeah. Well, now, you didn't grow up. You moved from Springfield to Chicago, and you grew up in Chicago? Well, I grew up in Oak Park. No, oh, I, no have, Park. I okay. have lived in the city, but growing up, I grew up right outside. Right. I mean, Oak Park is, and, is pretty close. And it's pretty, it's pretty city. It's a beautiful town, though. It's, like, very... Yeah. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wrighty. Right. Uh, yeah. I didn't live in the Frank Lloyd Wrighty part, but. Right. I, I was on the south side of the expressway. And so I, people called it North Berwyn. Yeah. And um, do you find, do you find a kinship among Midwesterners? Uh, do you find there to be similar? I mean, you said. You know, I do. I think it's, I don't, I haven't found a kinship. Among many lately, but I do think there is a thing with Midwest people, or definitely like friends from the Midwest, at least. At least people I think I like from the Midwest. Right. In some ways, there's a humility. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of sort of down-to-earth feeling about it. And that doesn't always work well with show business. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, humility doesn't necessarily serve you well in show business. And have you felt, because I certainly have felt that at times. Absolutely, you know, that yeah. It, it doesn't, like, oh, man, I should be a bigger dick, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I shouldn't be so humble and so, oh, whatever, no, it's fine. And do you get that, you know, do you find that too? You know, I do, I, but I've seen it as a good thing and a bad thing at, at whatever, if I'm at a f- good point. I feel, a good day I feel good about my career or a day I don't. Um, but, but I d- I mean, I've certainly cried a lot and I've taken a lot on the chin and I feel like taking it on. I guess I've always I've put it that way. I've always yeah. said, like, I'm good at taking it on the chin. But that can make you a target for right a lot of people who want to yeah. use it, who want a good punching bag. You, we make great punching bags. Yeah. And I have found, too, that being the non squeaky wheel, you don't get any grease. And right. I have. And I have heard, uh, oh, Andy won't mind, like, enough. Like, like. well, we will have to make him wait three hours to wearing a, <laughs> a leather costume. Oh, Andy won't mind, you know. You know, I and, think, actually, I've gotten good at saying no because of SNL. But still, I mean, I still will then, like, go out of my way to prove that I'm amenable. But uh, I think I've gotten better at that because of so many experiences of, of let's see what we can do. She'll do it. And then I finally yeah, one day yeah. went, I, well, I'm not going to do this because I just did that. So I don't think I have to do this today. I don't have to stand outside until 5 a.m. I'm going to put my foot down. I'm leaving at 4 a.m. Yeah, yeah. Did you always want to be a performer when you were young? I mean, was there a moment when it when you were like, it's the stage for me? <laughs> I think it was, I was pretty young. I mean, I was like a weird, loud kid and I performed a lot around the house. And I think my parents, just to get me out, they put me in a drama class in preschool. I mean, it wasn't like a real drama class. There were three of us and we were three years old and we, we did the elves and the shoemaker. I think they were like, "You go yell over there for a while. <laughs> and we'll pay someone to do it. Right. Someone else can deal with you. Were they, were your folks theatrical? Did they have any sort of like, I mean, not, not professionally, but just were they, you know, community theater people or? I mean, they both like to take credit for why I'm funny. I say that in quotes, you know, that I yeah. got my sense of humor from them. My dad's very loud. My uncle, his brother is a Broadway producer. So we saw a lot of shows. Oh, wow. But, but he didn't, wa- he was like, don't let her, don't let her enter show business. But, you know, show business in Chicago is. Yes. You know, it's a different thing. A different yeah. business. It's spelled differently, I think. For the Z. <laughs> yeah. So you were doing while you were a little kid. Did were you the, were you auditioning as a kid? I, well, I did community theater. I did my first play when I was eight. I did Grapes of Wrath, and I was Ruthie Jode. 
who was a 12 year old character. So that was kind of a big deal. I've, you know, it was like, well, I'm eight, but I'm playing a 12 year old. It shows <laughs> <laughs> my maturity. Probably uh, age makeup, a lot of, a lot of lines. A lot of age face. makeup, a lot of dirt, yeah. dirt makeup for the Jodes. Uh, and then I did my first like professional show in Chicago when I was 11, 10 or 11. And then I did, so I did, I worked in Chicago for a while until I was a teenager. And then I was just a teenager for a while. And was there a reason? Did your folks be like, because I would think being a, being a child actor is one thing, but being a teen actor. Is- for sure. I think like um, there's self-doubt and self-awareness and self-hate sets in. And that makes it a lot harder to yeah be on stage in front of people. Um, so right around 14, I was kind of, but I mean, I still acted in high school and there's just less roles, I think. And I don't blame people like who wants a 16 year old from the suburbs in a show in the city. Usually there's a 25 year old who's a normal functioning adult. That could play the 16 year old and you don't, and they don't have to go to school, you you know, yes, there's no child labor laws. There aren't those laws. You don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. And um, was it just the performing that you really liked or was it kind of, was there more to it? That was Well, it I mean, thing? if you would, as, as a child, I would have told you it was everything. I mean, I was a director and a writer and a DJ and a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, yeah, as a kid, I wanted to do it all. And then I, I don't want to do it all anymore. I do like performing and I like writing, but even writing was a, Another thing I had to learn to let myself say that I was because, because I didn't study it. And it was like, well, I don't have a degree in writing. How can I say I'm a writer? As if like, that's why I can say I'm an actor. Right, right. No, I think that's, yeah, that's, again, that's a very Midwestern thing, I think. I mean, just to say you want to be in show business is not very crazy. And I had a friend, or my stepbrother had a friend once who was from New York, and he said, you know, the thing about everybody in Chicago, you guys think everybody is showing off. Yeah. I always like that. I was like, yeah, that's true. You know, that's like our biggest fear. Like, all right, calm down. We get it. (laughs) The aspect of it that I always was kind of, well, I became aware of after, you know, I was older, is kind of like, look at those people over there trying yeah you know like you should know that it's just better to not really (laughs) try um so when you got over your uh and i get you know it it is i have a 15 year old daughter so i'm familiar with the age of not not wanting anyone to look at you yeah uh, because she went through that she where she was she liked acting and she liked being in school stuff and then it reached a, a certain age in puberty where she's just like no I don't want anyone looking at me ever. Right. Um, you know, which is just coming out of that. But but yeah, after that, were you sort of back to back to being ready to be stared I, at? Well, I don't think I'll ever get back to the level of like me at 11 or 10. But I, I'm certainly much more okay with making a fool of myself in front of people. I enjoy it. I miss, I can't wait until um, I'm vaccinated, until there's herd immunity in the world and I can go back to making a (laughs) fool of myself in front of other people again. Is that, do you have that dichotomy of kind of being a show off and a shy person? Uh, Yes, for sure. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Why do you think it's okay in some areas? Because I have it too. In some situations, yeah, sure, let it hang out. And then in others, I'm just like, I don't, I want to go home. You know, I yeah. want to be quiet. I want, I don't want all these, all this attention. Definitely. Well, I'm always, I'm um, a real nerd and into astrology. So I'm like, well, it does because I'm an Aquarius. But I think also there's just no like middle ground. I'm either like, okay, I'm going to go to the dance floor and, and perform for two hours for myself or I'm, I'm want to go home. And I don't want yeah. to talk to anyone. There's really, yeah, there's yeah. not a lot of in between, I think. And I don't know why that, I think it's like I either have to completely let go or or I'm, I don't let go. Completely withhold, yeah. Yeah. What's Aquarian about that? Because like when you said it, I thought like, wait, are those the twins? Because of duality? No, that but- does sound like Gemini. That's the twins. 
No, I just, there's a lot of um, Aquarian scene. We're eccentric, you know, known to be kind of weird and the clown, but also there's a lot of, we're more shy than people think. And I'm a Leo rising. So that's a whole other issue. You know, Leos are really uh, self-confident and, and put themselves out there. And so, and your rising sign is like your book covers. That's what people think oh. when they see me. Thank you for yeah. looking um, interested in this. No, I mean, I, I am, I mean, I find it interesting. I just can't remember. Like, I, and I like to, like, what I think is powerful about astrology, I mean, because I don't really think that the way the planets right. are lined up. Really, you yes. Know? But there's something about it's existed for this long that people find patterns in it that they that they note as being significant or apt and and then the and then the way that this story is told and retold and the way that you're given the advice part of a horoscope it obviously does something for us right and also too it's such i always think it's such a permission to uh, be self-involved to be oh, like I think openly like self-involved. That's what it's. That's why we like it. It's a way yeah. to talk about yourself and to talk about other people. Sort of, the, especially it's like if if you don't go to therapy, then you re- need it even more. You need to find some ways to talk through yeah. your stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and I guess there is some sort of it is aimed at self-improvement. I guess, and I, you know, and it, <laughs> it can be. Yeah, well, I think it is. I mean, unless you use it as, as the as, as an like, excuse. Yeah, as like this yeah. is why I'm an asshole. Um, I can't help it. Yeah, I have to treat you that way. Because like I'm a Scorpio, which, uh, and whenever I say, you know, like you say, like I'm a Scorpio, people go like, Ooh, oh yeah, oh Scorpio, and and I. A, like, I get it, because Scorpio sounds like the name from, like, a, <laughs> you know, a James Bond. It's yes. Scorpio, the What's arch it? villain. Mortal Kombat guy is. Oh, is there? Scorpion, or I don't know. I don't, what a horrible reference for me to use. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it sounds like I I am not, like, in terms of, like, a Scorpio, like a this dark, hard creature ready to strike and dangerous and sexy and i just feel like boy that's not me you know i just don't no, feel I, right. like you don't come off that that yeah way. i certainly don't feel like a guy named scorpio who might have an eye patch and a boat my dad my dad and my brother are scorpios and they're probably very mysterious they're very dark and sexy mysterious <laughs> e- evil your literary character or your biblical character is is, is satan i think is the devil for Scorpio? I think so. I mean, I'm saying it all wrong. I'm being very Midwest mom about this and not worrying about fact checking. But I, there is, I have some book that gives you like your literary character and your um, biblical character. Mine is the Aquarian female is Salome, I think. But oh, wow. I'm pretty sure the Scorpion male is um, Lucifer. All right. So there's something to think about. Anything to sort of bad boy up my image. <laughs> Can yeah. only help. Can only help. <laughs> Can't you tell my love's a growing? Growing up as you're, you know, you get into your teen years. Uh, do you, are you always thinking that you're going to do this nonsense for a living? Or is it just seem too silly? You know, I think it's that it's, I, I was always like, well, I can't see doing anything else and and feeling like my life was full or like I would always miss it if I don't have it. it was, so it was yeah. more that. The good and bad part of this business is there's not like a way to do it and there's not an ending point and a starting point. And it makes you crazy and always thinking you're keeping your head above water or not. But it's also good in that you can't you can't say that you're doing it wrong necessarily, or you can't say you don't have it. Uh, and there's always like something new to do. Yeah, was that a big part of it? Was that like because I always what I liked about the notion of doing this for a living, and it took me a long time to think that that was even possible. Was the fun that it was fun, yeah. and I just because you know. 
And I, it, there was just so much there's, I mean, for various reasons, there was just like a lot of sadness around mm -hmm. a lot of the people in my life. And it just felt like, oh, this seems, why not do something fun, you know? Yes, ab totally. I think that's a huge part. I think comedy especially is that is um, there. I, I, I feel similar where there was a lot of sad stuff uh, on and around growing up and in my 20s too. And it was sort of, I always feel good or not always, but I feel, usually feel good when I'm performing. Yeah. Did you always want to be a, a comedic actor? No, no, I started uh, as a, like a serious dramatic actor. But in my head, I mean, that didn't not include comedy. Sure. It was, the, I just wanted to kind of do all of it. But I loved doing a drama and, you know, I crying on stage and <laughs> getting to cry in front of people. It's my favorite thing. Uh, I do cry a lot. But I, it was, I, and I went to school, I got my BFA in theater from Cal Arts. And I was doing a scene from Angels in America. Sorry if you've heard this story before. I don't know where you would have. You would have really, you would have been my mother. You would have had to have. <laughs> but I was doing a scene from Angels in America because when I was 18, you know, that was, everybody did a scene from Angels in America in acting school. And I was doing that scene um, with Harper and she's on drugs and she says, are you a homo or whatever? The, and I remember, in, I was like, really feeling it and and then people were laughing when we performed it and that was sort of the first time i i had to rethink what it meant to be a serious actor or and or that it was like that is comedy too you know like so much of comedy you are being super dramatic and it's like yeah. life condition is what you're laughing at and i think also too that you find out like, if I play this big emotional moment, uh, is it going to make people laugh? Uh, you yeah. know, like, that's, and if it does, because I've had that, uh, <laughs> you know, I've had that certainly. And I've had it in, within comedies where, like, I just remember there uh, I did a show called Andy Barker P.I. And I was supposed to, like, go out and find my child's lost whoopee or something, you know, <laughs> like, a, like some sort of, and I had to, you know, like, yell like you know i'm gonna get this done or something <laughs> and my tv wife cracked up every single time and i felt like i was being george c scott but yeah you know, I, it's like no no it's just funny when i yell i mean i mean that's sort of what reality tv is for me too yeah it's just yeah yeah i don't even enjoy the competition ones i want to see women sitting around and talking and sometimes breaking down yeah, and then I'll and laugh. Having, yeah, be, being grandiose and throwing wine. Yeah. Yes. Falling. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. Wait, I, I, they did some, I got some research on you. And did you get kicked out of school for something? Yeah. Yeah. I got, uh, well, my, my high school life was sort of very colorful. I went to three different high schools. I, I was expelled from my public high school my sophomore year. Um, they found the the first bag of pot I ever bought. Uh, oh, yeah. What are the chances? Well, I left my book bag. I was auditioning for the Shadow Boxer, um, and I was really excited about that. So I left my book bag and just forgot about it. And they found my book bag, and I had just bought this bag of pot and didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I bought it with my friend, and it was like I don't, I can't roll joints. I don't. I didn't have anything to smoke out. So I just kind of had the bag of pot for a while. So it just sat in my book bag. So <laughs> how long had it been in your bag at that point? I don't even know. At, at least a week, I would say. Oh, that's so funny. And no smoking of it. Just right. And it's not that. And I had certainly smoked pot, but I had that was I hadn't bought a bag. So it was like, well, what do I do with this now? Yeah. I have to find a way to imbibe this. Right. But at least I've got it. I've got the creds. Um, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't do that well. I mean, I, it wasn't great for me because then I got expelled. Uh, what was that like? What was that? It was, it was awful. Um, yeah. And I was, because I was also like, again, I don't, I didn't want to be 
I didn't want to like stand out at all to anyone. I was in a huge high school and I was like handcuffed and walked through the school. Oh, wow. So it was just like so humiliating. And I, I was a good student and I liked doing theater. And so it was just, just such a nightmare. But I will say, I mean, it worked out because I, <laughs> my, the, my senior year of high school, I went to, um, the Chicago Academy for the Arts, which I really liked, but I, it took a while to get there. I went, I, so I was expelled and then I went to Catholic school, which is its own funny experience in Chicago to go to an all girls Catholic school. And then I went back to public school and then I dropped out. I got, I was pretty depressed for a while and I dropped out like spring of my junior year. Yeah. And I was already down to four periods a day or something. And it, it was like, I was going to have to be a fifth year senior to graduate, to, to get the requirements because I didn't have enough gym and I didn't have um, a class. I would have to take a class called consumer ed. Yeah. And it was like, Oh, I'm not going to be a fifth year senior. That's insane. So I dropped yeah, out. Yeah, for gym and Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But then I um so then I wasn't sure what I was going to do and then I found or my dad brought up the art school and I auditioned and got in, went there my senior year and did some correspondence classes and I graduated on time and had a ball. How were your folks about the Weed finding uh, was Catholic school like was that supposed to straighten you out? Is that no? You to it was Catholic actually school? like a nice thing because there the only other option that was presented was um, ombudsman was like a you know it was like a school for kids with behavioral disorders or something in the city, and that's where they would send kids who like smoked pot. And it was kind of. It, that sucks. And I mean, yeah. there's all these, I have issues now anyway. I'm still, I'll always like hold a grudge against our superintendent because I wasn't an athlete. I was an actor. And so athletes could get caught with anything and get a slap on the wrist, but it was like, Oh, really? Oh, so wow. So learning yeah, too bad. that was like, I'm not important. I'm disposable. Yeah. And feeling that way at 16. And then I, I was a national, I got a national merit commended scholar or whatever, something that wasn't like a level down from the real award uh, from the PSATs. And I wasn't allowed to go to the ceremony or anything because I wasn't allowed within a three block radius of my high school. Oh my God. But they got to like use me. They got to still have the statistic. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, so Catholic school was actually like, uh, a much better option. It was the better option. And my parents oh, okay. were really, were pretty nice about it. I mean, they, I mean, I was grounded for sure, yeah. but I think they saw it was kind of like you had to, I was handcuffed and I was at the police station and in my school, I was expelled. And so it was kind of, I think they went, that's probably enough yeah. <laughs> for you to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, what could they have done that's worse? I know. Like not letting me watch TV. It's not much worse. Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine going to arts school was pretty fucking great compared to It was so great, especially yeah. because I was coming I was so miserable and felt like you know, I under I was like seeing bureaucracy and falling through the cracks at 16, 17 and then all of a sudden I felt like this is a place where there was we we were all seen. It was like we were seen as individuals and we were treated as individuals. Everyone there was like the coolest person I'd ever met. Mm -hmm. um, I I had a Japanese foreign exchange student friend live with me. And it was just sort of like hanging out around, you know, people who were listening to jazz I'd never heard of or painting or something. And I was just yeah, like, yeah. whoa. It was, I've never, I'll never be that cool again. And I was faking it even then. But I was like, it was made me really much happier. I felt like I was genuinely happy again yeah and it, you're uh, just to be and this is what i mean i you know with my kids there there's a there's a arts uh you know out here in la there's an arts high school and my daughter's goes to a k through 12 school so she decided to stay at that one but like i was kind of telling her i was encouraging her to you know 
basic because I I don't think either one of my kids are going to get an MBA. I think they're both going <laughs> to be in some kind of creative field. And I just I just told her I said get around creative people as quickly as you can. Like just yeah, that's because that's where you're going to probably fit the best. And it's also just like where you're going to see people living a way that will be somewhat aspirational to you, you know? And I think it's just, it, it was all about, it wasn't like, oh, I'm studying acting and that's why it's great. It was, I was around, I was around people that I liked to be around, you know, they were weirdos like me. Yeah. Some weirder than others. And I appreciated everyone for it. But everybody was, again, it was like you got to be an individual. And it was, that was what was really exciting. And because you don't, you don't really feel that you're allowed to do that as a teenager anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I imagine you then went to theater school. You were full on. I was, yeah, then I was in. And I was like, I, I love, I, and I went to an art school for theater too. That was the, I, you know, I liked that environment. I wanted a conservatory program at an art school and I wanted to be in California. And so I really only had one choice and I had to get in. Was that Luckily, Cal Arts? And that was Cal, Cal Arts? Arts? yeah. Is that in Pasadena or Santa Clarita? Santa Clarita. Santa Clarita. So yeah, that's, and that's not the best, that's not the most exciting town in Southern California. It sure isn't. I mean, it was like known for uh, where, close to where James Dean died. That's right. That's what I knew of it. And Magic and Mountain. And Magic Mountain. Yes, yeah, yeah. of course. It's got, uh, it's got a Six Flags. Yes. Yeah. I, actually, Tim Burton went to Cal Arts, and I always tell people this little tidbit that who knows if it's true, but they said um, Edward Scissorhands was based on that town was like Valencia, and the house on the hill was Cal Arts. And oh wow! Just that that suburbia and the micro mansions. Yeah, he grew up uh, in Burbank too, and I live in Burbank now. And I think at times I feel like a really like a classic middle aged white man. Because I live in the town that Tim Burton based his whole career on rebelling from. Like everything, <laughs> like it seems like most of his work was like rejecting this boring suburban status quo. And I'm kind of like, well, I like it. I, there's yeah, a lot of parking. It's brave to embrace that, but thank you, you got to. You, it's, thank you, you have to. You like it. Uh, I do. Now, uh, is, is when you're in at Cal Arts, are you focusing on comedy, or are you still? No, so I was doing uh, theater, and Cal Arts is a lot of um, they do a lot of avant garde theater, which luckily I didn't do too much of. We were always like, "Oh, I'm in the puppet show," oh. you know, when you'd get cast in something. Yeah, yeah. They it, it, there was interesting stuff. I mean, I did a like a. Chinese opera with a director from China, from Beijing. I think he was Chen Shijiang. Mm -hmm. And then um, Stephen Merritt from Mag Magnetic Fields wrote the music. But I, I mean, they were like training us in Chinese opera movements. And it was, it's just like, that's Cal Arts. Right. It was probably offensive to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you've always, you've got that now under your belt. Like if they, you get hired. <laughs> There's a Chinese, your agent's like, hey, well, it's a Chinese opera. You can be like, no problem. Yeah, I don't know how good we ever got. I certainly was very out of my league. Actually, Allison Brie and I went to school. She was a year ahead of me. We were both in that, in that piece. Oh, wow. I was thinking about this other day, just about acting. And is there, is there anything that gets weird sometimes of like, you know, you're, <laughs> you know, like people, they plant seeds and get the food and then they're a farmer and or they, you know, put pipes in houses and they're a plumber. And then there's like this job that's I pretend to be other people, you, you know, like that that's because I think it's natural for your work to kind of become your identity. You know, I mean, like mm -hmm. it's been that way forever. Uh, I mean, you know, like people's name is Miller because there was somebody <laughs> ran a mills at some point. But I mean, I don't know. Is there just something weird about the psychology of like when your skill becomes your ability to be someone that you're not? 
Yes. No, I think about it sometimes and wonder if if that makes me sociopathic at all. And then I think of my job. I'm always, you know, I'll watch a commercial for uh, maxi pads or diarrhea medicine or something. And it's like, that's my job too. I'm yeah. glad I don't have to do that this week. Right, <laughs> right, right. But I constantly am watching commercials and why, because it's like, we're, those are, we're all actors. This yeah. is all our job. I could be doing that in a year. It's like, but wait, have I told you about this m- medicine? Yeah, yeah. Listen, Judy, you can roller skate again. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of them that I'm ch- truly humiliated by. But I think it's nice to not uh, to not have to be myself all, all the time. I think that's part of what's what I like about it. Yeah. You didn't stay in L.A. Did you want to go to California because you thought like ca- that eventually you would just segue into a Los Angeles life? I really was just like, I'm cold in Chicago. I want to go somewhere warm. (laughs) You know, it's like the first time you get a choice, a chance to move. It's like, I'm moving to the sun. Yeah. And I I was dating someone at the time and that was where we both would want to be. So it was, it was all of that, but a lot of, it was sunshine. I mean, it didn't work anyway, because I, I had to come home every winter for, for that break. So it's like I still had to go to Chicago in the coldest time ever. Yeah. And but you ended up back in Chicago after graduation. I did. Yeah. Well, not after graduation. And I was actually in France during my graduation. I was doing a show. Ooh la uh, la. It's super ooh la la. It's very cool. I mean, but that's one of the great things about Cal Arts was we had opportunities like that. And um they kind of went like, well, if you do this show, you won't be at graduation. So think of it. I was like, I'll do it. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine missing graduation. Yeah. Uh, so, and then I stayed in LA for seven months, I think. I took a class at the Groundlings. Mm-hmm. And I sold wine at Greenblatt's. And I loved the class at the Groundlings, which is really a, a big reason why I moved back to Chicago. Yeah, because it always, coming from Chicago, where you come out here, Having done I.O., I never did Second City, but I did Improv Olympic. And coming out here and then hearing Groundlings this and Groundlings that and feeling like, eh, that's that's a <laughs> rip off of what we do back in the back in the heartland. Right. So, yeah, I could. That's it's funny. Yeah. Very rarely. It's like people people, I think, start in Chicago and they come out here and do Groundlings and you did it backwards. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's kind of how I do everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you okay, and that was in your mind, like I'm going back to Chicago and I'm going to kind of focus on this kind of. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, I was also, I didn't know what I, what I was doing. I was making $9 an hour and spending my entire paycheck on my rent. And I wasn't even paying equal part rent anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it was also like, I was going to, be able to live cheaper in Chicago and, you know, every now and then my mom could buy me groceries if I need. Can't you tell my love's a growing? I imagine CalArts to Improv Olympic is a pretty big change. You know, the only big change was, I think, and I guess this is what's good about being kicked out of school and I had been told no. I had already like lost. I'd eaten humble pie. And so I think a lot of people when they graduated Cal Art is sort of like, well, I have my BFA. I don't, I'm not going to take classes anywhere. I know how to do it. Like I studied for four years. And I think saying I'm going to study more, I had like a, a humility already in me. So I think that was like the biggest, like no one at, no, no one I graduated with at that time would have taken a class. No way. Yeah. Was there a difference? Was it like, oh, this is so much more me or was it sort of just like a different, a different, like a different sort of muscle, you know? Well, I I had much more um, confidence when it was theater. So I was like, I know I'm good at this. And I was always terrified doing comedy and doing improv and being like, well, I didn't study that. And I haven't been doing that since I was three years old. So I don't know how to do this. And, you know, seeing so many good shows and bad shows, like at IO and Second City. So, but I was never 
I never was <laughs> confident about it. Really? Yeah. Never, I ever? Don't, I don't think I was ever, no, never, ever, never fully confident. I'm sure I pretended I was sometimes, but I definitely wasn't. Because I feel, I always feel like you got to, I mean, at least for me, having been on Conan Island for years and years and, <laughs> you know, being lucky enough to have a steady job and a st- like, I, I haven't auditioned a lot in years um, and usually when like I get a side gig, it's just kind of, they, you know, it's, they want me cause I'm me, but yeah. like, but I always auditioning, I always felt like I have to believe I am the greatest. Like I have to go in there without caring whether or not I get it, take it or leave it there, you know, their loss if they don't hire yeah. me, you know? And so I, it's just, I mean, for you to not be, feel confident about improv, And then to go be on Saturday Night Live, what's happening? How do you do it? (laughs) Well, I think it's just, it's, it's that crazy of a thing that sort of happens to you. You know, I, I was like in shock the whole first year on the show anyway. It wasn't, I went from like doing, I wasn't even on stage at second, I was in the touring company of second stage. I was an understudy for the stages and I was like, you know what? If this is what my life is, I'm very happy with that because I get to perform. Yeah. Um, and I had come to that point in my life. So, and then all of a sudden I was on the show I watched. It, and, and so that was, I didn't really understand for a year. But I think that's part of SNL is that we're not like working comedians necessarily, not known comedians. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you're all of a sudden on TV. And then you you learn how to buy clothes that fit your body for the first time. <laughs> and you're like, oh, isn't that something? That's what I should have been wearing. Yeah. Who knew? What was, was that first year? Did you feel just so overwhelmed by the opportunity that that you that that was kind of more flummoxing than the actual environment of the show itself or the institution that it is? Because it that's the, that that show is like an institution. That's not. Just, right, you know, any TV show. Right. I no. I, I mean, I don't think there's even time to have that kind of self reflection. It's you, you're immediately thrown in, and there's really nobody. There's no rules. I was like, and where where is the backstage? Yeah, <laughs> they're like this. Yeah. What do you mean? It's like, oh, there's not a whole backstage behind that door that I've seen <laughs> the host come out of. Yeah, like I didn't even know how it was how the floor was set up right. so it's really you're just sort of someone's hold grabbing your hand and you're running and yeah. that's what it felt like I, just like a chicken with my head cut off so and chickens with their heads cut off don't self-reflect often i don't think <laughs> <laughs> well maybe the head does yeah the head like, it is i look good from behind the head's like how did this happen how did i get here <laughs> <laughs> why am i still running what what do you think what what made the difference between sort of just like the getting a more sense of poise about being there was it just the time or was there any kind of one moment that helped or a person that helped time for sure um and then uh it's certainly you know being around people i really looked up to and thought were so great and um having them say that something was good sort of made up for all the bad voices and every bad comment that you'd read. That's like, I mean, that's, what's really, that's the hardest part I think is like all of a sudden there's really awful things written about. And it's like everything you've thought, the worst things you've thought about yourself, someone has put into words and written down online. Yeah. And so then you're like, well, it must be true if I think it and someone else thinks it. And so, and you're just talking about randos. You're not talking about like critics or anything. Mostly randos. I, I mean, I wouldn't even know the difference between randos and critics. It was weird to go from nothing to all of that. And I mean, you watch it with everybody who comes into the show. It's like I'm so happy, and then I'm like just wait and wait till the show. You don't get your things on, and you get cut, and you're like, I'm fucking yeah. miserable, or like. I suck. I mean, you just, your ego takes such a beating and then you rebuild it sort of at that show. Um, I think Lauren was certainly helpful was, 
I was lucky in that I had a good relationship with him early on. It's taking it on the chin. It's again, it's if you're, if you can do that. And then I think um, it's like therapy now for me to talk to the newer people and sort of make them feel better and go like, I know it's okay that you're crying in sketch comedy. Sometimes, yeah. it ha you know, we, we all do and you're doing well. Getting to help them is very therapeutic for me. And like, that's why I went through that. That is good. That is helpful. Yeah. Because there is like, I mean, that's the way to, that's the optimal way to handle adversity is to those then that come after you who go through the same is not to go, <laughs> not to go like, you know, ha ha. Yeah. Ha -ha. Like, you know, it's like you, you now you deal with it. If you've been hazed, you either haze or you stop the hazing, you know, and I think it's much preferable to stop the hazing. That's quite a brave stance for me to take. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hashtag stop the hazing. Stop the hazing. Yeah. And it, and you're right. That is because I, starting on the Conan show, there, it was very weird. The amount of people, like I always have said, like it's, the different way, all the different ways to call me fat, like was just like, uh -huh. uh, like, wow. It's so, you know, re just, just. I mean, I was pregnant for six years or something. <laughs> it's like, I must, it's like I have an elephant, I'm gestation period of an elephant. But, and I also, there was one guy I remember too, that said, said something about me. And then there's Richter, you know, who's like the boring <laughs> slob that, <laughs> wouldn't have a friend oh unless God. nice guy O'Brien had befriended him. And I was like, Jesus. fuck, man, I don't deserve friends, according to this writer. <laughs> yeah. And it was like a, it was like an AP writer, too, at the time. Uh, it was I mean, in the paper, it's insane. You know? Yeah. Like, I don't deserve, I, I wouldn't have friends <laughs> if it weren't for Conan O'Brien. <laughs> you know? Like, wait a minute. But even at the, and then you didn't have to, there was no online. There was no... You know, it right. wasn't like randos were silent pretty much unless they wrote you a letter. Um, right. So, yeah, it's a lot worse now because people are fucking nasty. It's bizarre. But I think it makes it also like helps you be nicer and like, oh, I'm not going to be judgmental in that yeah. way because uh, I don't want to be that ever. Yeah. And it's sketch comedy. This is we're. We're all making a different fart joke and being like, mine is high art and that one isn't. Right, right. It's just, it's all, it's very subjective. And, but what, what isn't subjective is that people are working hard. Yeah. And so that's what I can appreciate in everything. Now, SNL kind of has a school year. You know, you, you've got your summers off and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And um, as the year, do you approach each new season uh, differently as, you know, as time has gone on? Has there been something that sort of, helped? No, uh, I would always have all these weird, like, should I have been working more? Again, it's all just waves of how I feel about my career and my life. And I'm not doing enough. I'm embarrassed to go back because I didn't work over the summer. And, and I think yeah, there's always like you're nervous going in and like, do people think this about me? Because it's, and then you go in and you're like, oh, it's all my same friends, yeah. the same people. I, it's your friends. Yeah, yeah. And you're back to making the same fart jokes. And then you're like, this is great. <laughs> well, I don't know why I worried. Why was I thinking anyone would think anything about me? Nobody's thinking about me in a good way. They're not thinking about that, me. Yes. Yeah. No, that's always a good thing to remind yourself when you you know, I always think like, oh, I bet that person's mad at me. And I realize, ah, oh, they're not even thinking of me. <laughs> they, yeah, right. Now, has the, has being on SNL, because it's been nine seasons, it's your ninth? Yeah. That's hard, because I feel like you were the new kid two minutes ago, you know, <laughs> it's just. Uh, yeah. So when I saw that nine, that's like, wow. Um, and congratulations. Kudos on sticking well, it out. You. Um, is there something that being on the show, on that, that particular show this long, like, has that had dividends sort of within your own sort of, uh, you know, the, how you view yourself, how you, how you live in your life and how you relate to the people in your life? Um, well, it certainly like, uh, becomes a part of your identity. And, and I think that's, what's was always like the scariest thing to me about even thinking about leaving yeah. was like, what am I if not someone on SNL? But I think 
being on for nine years, I it was like at year seven that I went, I'm okay leaving. Yeah. I finally feel, I feel comfortable there. I feel like I sort of know my position there and I get to then have fun. Yeah. It's more fun to when I'm not constantly worried about like, what is my, what's my legacy or something stupid, whatever you can think of to like, I was to not feel okay that day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling okay. What can I think right now to change How can that? I self-sabotage? Yeah. <laughs> You're now you're doing a new show with Keegan Michael Key, correct? Yes, yes. And it's called Schmigadoon. Yeah. And is uh, it's is that Brigadoon? I mean, obviously. It is. Yes. I mean, it's it's the name is to to let you know that we are living in a musical. It's a couple that goes um, on a hike to fix their relationship, and they are they get lost in this town that is an old musical. Oh, cool. Um, it's really cool. And it was like, uh, it, we filmed it and Broadway's been dark. And so it was really getting to do theater during COVID. It was it, every day felt like it was magical. And everyone who worked on the show, I, I think I wrote more like love letters, you know, platonic love letters to everybody. I just really loved everybody. And it felt like it was all the right people. Everyone who was there should have been there. And we're, it's like theater people and you don't get to rehearse and we don't really get to be around each other. And so those moments that we got to were just so wonderful and, and loving and special and funny and all of it. It was really, really a wonderful experience. So that you couldn't have, COVID prevented you from having actual rehearsals, which has got to be a very weird way to shoot a musical show. So yeah. weird. And everybody who came in, you know, I, Jane Krakowski's in it. She's unbelievable. Yeah. She's so good. She has this number that's like killer. And and she kind of went, is that, wait, those are the only takes I get? And it was like, yeah, that's, we got to keep moving. Wow. We, I, we have to be done. And Yeah. Um, and I think that was weird for everybody, but that was just, that's how to do it. Was it shot in New York? So, No, we were in Vancouver. Oh, yeah, because I was, I, I was wondering if with Broadway being shut down, did you have like your pick of the, of the musical people? No, but we, sort of, we still got a lot of, um, we s- sort of still did have a pick of musical people. I mean, we... We had Kristen Chenoweth and Aaron. Aaron Tveit won basically won a Tony while we were wow filming because the nominations came out and he was the only person nominated. That's awesome. And it was like, well, we have a Tony award. Congratulations, Aaron! And then we would film. Um, <laughs> Enough about you. Yeah, congrats. Now let's get back to work. But it was really, really, really talented people and. And everybody worked really, I think it was just so important to everybody. And so you could tell everybody worked a lot by themselves on their own time. So that when we finally got to do it, everybody was so prepared. And so like, I'm so ready to do my number. Yeah. And they they killed it. That's great. Do you have like a, I wish I could sing and dance all the time kind of, like if every job had some singing and dancing, do you <laughs> like singing in public? I love, I like singing singing more than dancing. I mean, I, I like my own kind of dancing, but I'm not a great dancer. I'm always, I've always been jealous of great dancers. I think dancing is wonderful. And I'm like, you're so expressive. And then I think I'm doing that. And if I ever see what I look like, that's not what I'm doing. Um, it's not what it is in my head. (laughs) Uh, and even like singing, I've always been like, well, I can sing it for sketch comedy. And so, Working like alongside these heavy hitters, I was, I was certainly, uh, I was very intimidated. And you just have to do it though, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I definitely tried to like uh, get in with the choreographer because I was really most afraid of dancing. And I was kind of like, all right, Chris, let's be friends. So I can then say, well, Chris, we don't really want to do that move, right? Yeah, you're not going to make me do that. Yeah. How about I just walk from one spot to another? How about that? Yeah, maybe I don't dance in this part. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funnier? <laughs> uh, yeah, I hate choreography and have I, I hate having to do it. It just makes me mad because it just, 
it's like the one yoga class I ever took. I, I had this, it's gotten better over the years, but like an, just an adversarial relationship with my body. Like, it's like, I feel like. Absolutely. You know, That's the biggest part yeah, of it. Yeah, it's like, why? I didn't choose you, this vessel, <laughs> you know? I would not. Yeah. Have, yeah. Um, And I just, on one of the shows I was on, there was like a, they thought, oh, they'll, there's like a little fantasy sequence and it's a musical and. You know, and I was like, can I just come in in the end and put on a button on the scene? <laughs> like, yeah. Can yeah, I? Yeah, okay. You know, like it was originally. Let me do the comedy They had like me part, like yeah. doing the lead and all this stuff. And I was like, couldn't all the other characters? <laughs> and I just sort of pop in at the end. And it's like I've spent my whole life trying to make sure, like, look at my head. Look at, you know, smoke and mirrors to not show my body. And then all of a sudden I'm like, that's all I get to do? <laughs> it, like, can I do? I'm great at face yeah. dancing. It's like <laughs> I've been trying to fool everyone into not noticing my body for years. Yeah. And then it's like, that's all you get to use? No way. <laughs> Haven't you noticed the mirrored poncho I'm wearing? <laughs> right. Uh, you notice that my hair is gigantic. I'm like a drag queen. On I'm like, look up here. Look over here. Hero. Look at my lashes. <laughs> Don't look down. <laughs> well, do you. Um, Go ongoing. What do you? I mean, what what what's what do you think you're going to be doing? I mean, aside from renovations, you know, we talked you're going to be doing some <laughs> renovations. Um, yes. I mean, what what's what's in in store for you? I I don't know, uh, and I think part of that has been this weird, you know, what COVID has done, and it's made me more comfortable not knowing and sort of. I feel okay about that. And, you know, I, I, I never thought I'd write a book or I didn't think I would write a book. It's certainly not that book. And I did. Mm -hmm. I'd never thought the Apple TV plus show would actually, we'd actually make yeah. it because, you know, you talk about things forever that you don't do. And so it's like have, doing both of those things during a, a time when the world shut down was already, that's shocking. Yeah. I had no idea. And so I'm sort of, I'm try trying to be more comfortable and like listening to what else, just what's going to come my way. And I'll, I'm more open to things, I suppose, more close to some things and more open to seeing what happens. But yeah, that's what happens. You get older and you just sort of, it's just like, you just feel like you don't have the time for the, you know, the stuff that's not you and just like, might right. as well stick to the things that are me. Yeah. Know? And, and, I'm gardening. I want to try gardening. I want to, you know, there's not that I'm going to become a farmer. Right. But I might. You never know. Nothing's stopping you. Yeah. Um, did now is is uh, Schmigadoon, is that are you a creator on that show? Is it? I have producer credit, but I didn't um, write it. We have um, Cinco and Ken wrote it. They did Despicable Me. They're really great um, writers. Um, and Cinco was our showrunner. So, and then Barry Sonnenfeld directed it. Oh, cool. And when's it coming out? Summer is what we know of this year. Okay. Summer of this year. All right. Well, uh, the third question of these three is what have you learned? Um, you any big advice? You know, you seem real pushy about getting your worldview out. <laughs> That's what the book's for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, um, and when is that out? I should ask that. When does the book come out? The, uh, that's summer too. That's August. Big summer. I know. It's really, it's like, I'm actually terrified. I'm more terrified about the book than anything because I'm, I've been so private. And then all of a sudden it's like, I'm, I'm publishing my therapy really. And it was like keeping a diary during the, such a crazy yeah. time. And then like, well, I should share that with everyone. It's insane. Uh, you're still you're still ambivalent about it about sharing that much. Well, I mean, I you did it. I don't think I can be. Yeah. yeah, I have to now be excited. I gotta fake it till I make it because it's it's going out yeah. there. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm I'm gonna be in some legal trouble. <laughs> but I have a wonder. I really like my editor. He's held my hand throughout the process, and uh, so we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. I have no. I, I just don't. I, I'm like, what is this summer gonna be like with? these two things that are so new. Um, but what I've learned is it won't matter. It matters to, to be alive and to be with 
people that you love. And if you get to do what you love, aren't you lucky? Well, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, and it's a pretty basic truth too, because it doesn't, <laughs> I, as I've, I've said before, you know, like if they, if some alien overlord lands and they <laughs> start looking at people as essential personnel and non-essential personnel, like I'm getting vaporized. <laughs> Unless they need to commercials. No, because it is like, what do you do? Um, I say words and ma play make-believe. <laughs> I know. I can't even. My mom is was a nurse practitioner for a long time. And I'm like, I can't. I, I faint if I see blood. So <laughs> I, I can't even like physically help people. Well, that's a good place to end this. You can't even physically help people. <laughs> Can't and won't. Can and won't. Fuck you. I got mine. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to get yours. Well, Cecily, thank you so much for taking the time. And thank uh, you. And good luck with this new show. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. I really am. I think it's nice to to share something that I I think is so joyful. Yeah. And is SNL on for next year? Or is that is that up in the air? It's all. Everything's up in the air. Yeah, it'll depend on a lot, I guess. It'll depend on how I feel in August, I suppose. All right. Well, it's a big summer. Everyone, remember, this is uh, Cecily Strong's summer, not your summer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Uh, thanks again, Cecily. And um, I will be back next week with more three questions. 